Welcome everyone and thanks for being here. I'm Kavita Kadriza. I'm a correspondent for Education Week and joining me today is John King. He's the former Education Secretary and now he's the President and CEO of the Education Trust. Thanks so much for coming by, John. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> so, big news, the skinny budget for education was released and it calls for a 13.5% cut. That's about $9 billion. Um, I really saw the difference between you, the former secretary, and the current secretary, Betsy DeVos, summed up in kind of two quotes. She has called her brand of reform a way to advance God's kingdom. And you looked at the skinny budget and wrote, it's a way we would be going backwards. And so very different views, whether we're moving forwards or backwards. Um, we have 11 million poor children in public schools. The federal budget director has said they've cut the most wasteful, indefensible programs. How is this going to affect poor kids? Well, you know, this budget is really an assault on the American dream. You look at what's happening with uh, professional development for teachers, Title II. Uh, that's money that's used to help teachers to improve their craft. It's also used to uh, support the hiring of teachers in many districts, particularly high-needs districts. That program is totally eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a program called 21st Century uh, that's focused on after-school programs, summer programs for high-needs kids, totally eliminated. And we know the difference that after-school and summer programs can make. That may be the one safe place that kids have to be in some high-needs communities. That's totally eliminated. Uh, aid for students who are going to college, high-needs students going to college, dramatically cut, including stealing essentially $4 billion from Pell Grants for other purposes. Pell Grants are used to support low-income students going to college. Right? So the, this budget really is an attack on the very uh, resources that students in high-needs communities need to be successful, um, not to mention the cuts to the safety net, which also have a terrible impact on high-needs kids and their families. I wanted to talk about some of these individually. So when we talk about teacher training, actually that was the first budget cut that jumped out at me just because we hear over and over again, teacher training, teacher professional development makes a huge difference and a good teacher can make all the difference um, with, with kids, often high needs kids. That's right, I mean that was my experience growing up in New York City and going to school in Brooklyn. Uh, I lost both my parents as a kid and it was a great teacher. Uh, who was my teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Mr. Oswa. He saved my life. If not for him, I wouldn't be here today. And Title II is really about investing in teachers. And I think it sends a terrible message to educators uh, when, you, when you eliminate the very program that's intended to support them. Um, another one was Pell Grants. You had talked about stealing $4 billion of surplus. But Pell Grants, actually, the, it's level funding, right? There are cuts to... The, I mean, the surplus can't be used, and then there are cuts to um, kind of related programs that help um, first-generation low-income kids get to college, so Gear Up, Trio. Um, some people say, you know, Pell Grants are the same, so we should be fine. Do you think wh when you take away from a supporting structure, it kind of affect, will affect these kids? Well, for sure. I mean, we know the cuts to some of the related aid programs will directly take dollars away that would have helped students go to college next year. Uh, the, the cuts to the Pell Grants, by taking money from the surplus, that's money that can't then be spent on Pell students. We ought to be talking about increasing the size of Pell Grants. We know Pell Grants cover a lower share of the cost of college today than they did 20 years ago. We should be increasing the amount so that more low-income students can go to college and succeed there. We should also be talking about year-round Pell. And one of the restrictions on the Pell program now is that students run out of their Pell dollars by the time they get to the summer. They can't take summer classes. It reduces the likelihood that students will graduate on time. We should be investing additional dollars in Pell so that students can continue their studies over the summer. It would increase graduation rates. It would result in a more prepared workforce and a stronger economy. And that's really one of the ironies here. You know, the, the president, uh, the 45th president uh, on the campaign trail talked about wanting to uh, invest in the American workforce uh, to create greater opportunity for folks who've been left behind. Uh, this budget does the opposite. It takes opportunities away from the folks who are most vulnerable. I was just thinking of something. Uh, the economy was a big talking point on both sides during the election. 
And when I talk to people who study international education, they always talk about education being the long-term investment in, mm -hmm. in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like that has a direct correlation. That, that's exactly right. It's one of the reasons why I think we should, we should be talking about today how to invest additional resources in education. We should be talking, as you and I have in the past, about early learning, which has an eight to one, nine to one return on every dollar invested. And we should be talking about how do we invest more in getting the best teachers to the highest needs kids, because so often kids in high needs communities are in schools where there's lots of teacher turnover, and they aren't getting the strongest teachers. Many times in high needs communities, they also aren't getting advanced courses like physics and chemistry and AP classes. We should be talking about how to put resources there. We should be talking about investing more in public higher education so that students have the opportunity to go to college for free. You know, President Obama proposed um, America's College Promise, the idea that all students would have the opportunity to go to two-year community colleges for free. That's what we should be talking about. Instead, we're talking about cuts that will devastate opportunities for low-income students. So I want to go back to a cut you talked about where you said after-school programs, as we all know, they help kids. Mm -hmm. um, I've read a lot of people saying after-school programs do nothing. They don't show academic um, gains. So how would you, like, we are clearly, like, there are s such different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to that? Well, a couple of things. One, there are different kinds of after-school and summer programs. And it is true that some of them are less effective than others. But there's very clear research evidence that well-designed after-school programs and summer programs can make a huge difference in student achievement. Particularly in summer, we know there's a lot of what's called summer learning loss, where students who are home for the summer aren't engaged academically aren't getting enrichment, actually fall behind, lose months of learning over and the summer. And those are particularly poor children. That's exactly right. So this investment through the 21st Century uh, Community Centers Fund, that's, those are resources that can support high quality after school and summer programs. Now, if someone wants to say, we should strengthen the evidence requirements for that program, we should have more rigorous evaluations, we should fund programs more that have demonstrated results, and reduce funding for programs that aren't able to produce those results. That's a conversation worth having within a context that we need more after school and more summer opportunities for poor kids, not less. Uh, but I, I think some of the conversation about results is actually being used as a way to distract from the core question of whether or not we should be making investments in young people. Okay. I want to kind of move a little bit um, and ask you something. So the Obama administration had invested heavily in like uh, school improvement grants, race to the top, like billions of dollars. And independent ev evaluations have found that they really haven't made a difference. How would you answer someone when they said, well, I mean, additional dollars is not the answer? Well, again, this is a case where I think you've got to look beneath the program level to what are initiatives that have worked. So if you look at California, for example, in California, there was a, a rigorous evaluation of their use of school improvement grant dollars, and they found that there were a set of schools that made significant progress because there was a substantial investment in teacher professional development and efforts to retain uh, strong teachers, um, which you know, so further supports also the investments that we're making in Title II, by the way. Right? There are other places where school improvement grant dollars were not as well used. So that's a fair critique, that the program left a lot of discretion to local and state decision making. Some investments worked better than others. But the answer isn't then eliminate the resources for high need schools. The answer is structure the program so that we invest more in efforts that are getting results. And so in the Obama administration, we prioritized the focus on evidence driving decision making. You know, we had the Investing in Innovation grant program where you actually got more funds based on whether you had a good hypothesis or really strong evidence or demonstrate evidence in multiple sites to justify a large investment in scaling up a particular program. That's the way we should be thinking about these things, but we shouldn't abandon investments in young people. Um, some money kind of remains level, so special education funding is at the same level, and there are actually areas where there are more funds. So there's one billion for school districts with poor children, 168 million increase for charter school programs, uh, 250 million for a new private school choice program. The administration clearly sees school choice as a way to have equity, right, as a way to help poor kids. Tell me why you disagree. Yeah, well, there's good choice and bad choice. And 
you know, I would contrast, let's say, Massachusetts, which has a strong public charter school law. These are public schools that are publicly accountable. They have more flexibility, but there's a high bar to get a charter. There's rigorous oversight of charters and a willingness to close schools that are low performing. I contrast that with Michigan, where there is a, a weak charter law and a proliferation of low performing for-profit schools uh, that aren't serving kids well. And so that you could do public school choice well or poorly. Uh, my hope would be that if there is um, any investment in charter schools, it's done in a way that advances quality charter authorizing, quality charter laws. Uh, I'm, and I worry that there's good evidence from what we've heard so far from the administration that they're not interested in that level of real public accountability. So when you say public accountability, um, they ha take the same tests, for example, so we can measure mm -hmm. academic growth. Mm -hmm. They have to report certain things. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay. They have to serve special education okay. students. They have to serve English learners. Uh, they have to demonstrate that they're getting students to graduation ready for what's next. Right? And, and they're keeping the promises that they made in their charter application. Now, charters are one thing. Vouchers are quite another. I think the evidence is quite clear that voucher programs that exist around the country have not delivered results. For so students. vouchers are, are public dollars that students can take and attend private or parochial schools. That's exactly right. And you know, the reality is in many communities, there really aren't that many private school options, particularly if you think about rural communities mm -hmm. around the country. So what you're really talking about is vouchers to incentivize the creation of more for-profit schools. Uh, I think that's exactly the wrong direction. We've seen in the states that are implementing voucher programs lower academic outcomes for the students who participate and less public accountability. Places where schools are turning away students with disabilities or not protecting student civil rights. Places where vouchers have been used over the course of American history as a way to increase segregation in schools. Um, I think vouchers are a, a big distraction from the real work, which is strengthening our public education system. What about um, vouchers for, not, not for the for-profit schools, but say parochial schools or private schools? Yeah. Um, we, had, we have that in DC. Yeah, I worry again that, that it's, it's a distraction from the core work of improving public education and inherently less publicly accountable. Uh, the private schools are not part of the same systems of public governance where you have to account for how resources are used. You have to account for how you're protecting student civil rights. You have to account for how you are assessing teacher readiness for the classroom. And so I do, I, 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 me personally, uh, I'm very skeptical that, that voucher programs um, will help. I think they are much more likely to uh, take resources away from public education and distract us from our core mission. Um, so it's not over. There are $2 million in the skinny budget that is, we don't know where those cuts are coming from. Do you worry that's like Office of Civil Rights, um, Korea and Technical Education, like I'm very worried about that. Um, you know, the skinny budget doesn't give a lot of detail, even on some of the programs that it does describe, like the additional billion dollars for Title I. It's unclear if that would really go to high-need students or that would end up being used for um, some sort of portability scheme where the resources are actually taken away from high-need schools and given to more affluent schools. It's unclear from their budget. It is also unclear where these other $2 billion plus in cuts are going to come from. And I worry a lot. You know, if you go after career and technical education, for example, we know, given the challenges we have in, in building a competitive 21st century workforce, business leaders all over the country are saying we need more students who are ready for high-skilled jobs, not less. And taking money away from, from career and technical education programs will harm businesses. It will harm the economy and again is in stark contrast with some of the rhetoric that we heard on the campaign trail. Also, um, Korea and technical ed often is done by community colleges which mm -hmm. disproportionately serve low-income yes, students. Yes, yes. And again it comes back to, you know, on the campaign trail the 45th president talked about folks who have been left behind, folks who are struggling. For many of those folks, community colleges are a lifeline. It's the place where you know, the working mom goes to get additional education so she can move up at the workplace. It's the place where the, you know, the laid off worker whose manufacturing job has left can go and get training for a new job in, in a 21st century economy uh, field. 
if you reduce resources for community colleges, you're harming the very people uh, that the 45th president said he was trying to protect. Um, the federal um, dollars just account for actually 10% of the money that flows, right? About 90% mm -hmm. of the money spent on education comes from local and the district level mm -hmm. or state level. Mm -hmm. Do you think states and districts can make up for this money if well, these cuts go through? the reality is um, the highest need states and districts can't. Um, they're struggling in terms of their own revenue sources. And so I think what you'll see is cuts that directly impact students. Now, will there be some affluent districts that can make up for the loss of Title II dollars, for example? Sure, that, that is possible. Um, but those are dollars that should otherwise be going to other activities that would support the highest need students. Um, in my view, and, and you know, we've talked about this many times, that the federal government should be investing more and, and not less. And what we see here is a dramatic reduction of the federal investment. And true not just in education, it's true in, in health care, it's true in transportation, it's true around the environment, around housing, all of these issues that affect directly the kids who are most vulnerable. So I want to move on to a quick rapid fire round, but I want to remind everyone we're listening to John King. He's the president and CEO of the Education Trust. He's also the former Secretary of Education. So you had kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. You have a very compelling personal story. And I want to ask you, the criticism against Betsy DeVos has been she hasn't been to public school. She hasn't sent her kids to public school. Do you think that's a valid criticism of a disconnect? Well, I'll say this. You know, for me, having been a public school student, having been a teacher and a principal in public schools, having my kids in Montgomery County Public Schools, all of those things inform how I think about education. They informed how I did my work at the department. They inform uh, how I think about issues now at the Education Trust. That said, I'm more interested in the substance of someone's views than uh, necessarily exactly which experiences they've had. So you could be an effective Secretary of Education and not, for example, uh, have been a teacher. Um, but what I would hope is that you see the value of teachers. You understand that teachers are the linchpin of our educational system, that we should be doing more to support our teachers. And all the signals are that it's not well understood uh, by uh, the current education department team, given that they're walking away from Title II, which is to support teacher professional development. Um, you know, you don't have to have gone, for example, to a historically black college to understand the important role that they play in our society and to understand the history around historically black colleges. Uh, but you do have to study and learn and, and you have to be committed to understanding their important role. Uh, some of the Secretary's comments equating historically black colleges and universities with school choice, ignoring the fact that the schools were created uh, by necessity because of the history of uh, slavery and segregation in this country and the impact that that's had on access to opportunity. Those kind of insensitive remarks reflect an unwillingness to get the right information and that worries me much more uh, than her, you know, what college she went to. Is there anything you like in the budget? <sighs> Unfortunately, across the board, it's, it's really headed in the wrong direction in almost every instance. Uh, you know, there are things that were protected. I was glad that uh, IDA wasn't special cut, education. right? Mm -hmm. Investments in special education weren't cut. But that's hardly something to celebrate. We actually know the federal government doesn't fulfill nearly the level of spending right. in special education that was promised uh, when IDA was last reauthorized. So th they had promised that they would give states about 40% of the cost mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. special education mm -hmm. students often cost mm -hmm. much more, mm -hmm. um, and they haven't come close. So, exactly, okay. exactly. So, you know, it's, it, it, I think it would be a mistake for any of us to look at the, uh, you know, the places where there haven't been draconian cuts and, say, and declare victory from that. Um, you know, the, law, the, the, the primary impact of this budget will be to reduce opportunity for low-income students. Um, say it was under the previous administration, you were still Secretary of Education, and President Obama said you have to cut 10%, like for some whatever reason. Like, we just have to make cuts. Where would you make cuts? You know, 
I, the reality is I don't think President, President Obama would have asked us to do that in education. You know, he would have looked to other places in the budget for cuts because he understood the role that education plays in the long-term success, not only of our economy, but of our democracy. And I think that's a values question that one has to ask about this administration, about governors as well. Uh, the folks who go to education first for cuts are making a long-term mistake because ultimately the strength of your state's economy or your nation's economy depends on having a well-prepared workforce. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing about, I think it was the, the Czech Republic, um, where an international, like someone who studies international schools, like showed me how much they invested and then a few years later how they saw mm -hmm. the return on that's investment. That's right, that's right. And this is really a national security issue. You know, much has been made of this idea that resources are being reallocated to defense. And one question I would ask is, isn't it in our long-term national security interest to have a well-educated American populace? Right? Isn't it in our national security interest to have students who, when they finish high school, can actually join the military? And one of the things that we see is that there are many places around the country where very few of the students meet the minimum standards to enter the military. Shouldn't we be worried about that from a national security perspective? Isn't it a threat to our national security if we can't train enough engineers to have our businesses be competitive with the rest of the world? Uh, so again, I, I just find this budget and, and the priorities very short-sighted and misguided. I've got a, a last question. So some people are like, oh my gosh, this, is, this budget is like really devastating. And others are like, it's never going to pass. Don't worry, it has to go through Congress. They're not going to let the cuts go through. How worried are you and how worried do you think everyone should be? I think folks should be worried, partly because the president's budget proposal sets the baseline for the discussion. It is true, ultimately Congress decides, and uh, I do hope that there will be courageous Republicans who will stand up for uh, low-income students having access to college, who will stand up for teachers getting the kind of support that they need, uh, and I'm hopeful about that. Uh, but I worry that this budget has framed the debate, so much so that we're focusing on the places where we're thankful there aren't cuts, as opposed to the argument we should be having, which is how do we do more around early learning, for example. You know, we've only got about 40% of four-year-olds in public preschool programs. That's not good enough. We should be doing more to have more students get the kind of quality start that will allow them to be successful in K-12. That's the conversation we should be having. We should be having a conversation about free college tuition and what we can do to make sure that all Americans have access to higher education. But we're not having that conversation. Instead, we're talking about, well, what can we do to protect after-school programs, or what can we do to protect Meals on Wheels, even? Um, it, you know, this budget, I, I fear, has focused the conversation in the wrong place. Um, is there anything else you want to add that I haven't asked you about and you think is really important? Well, I think you know, whether it's on the budget or on implementation of the Every Student Succeeds Act, the new federal education law, um, the conversation now moves to states. And the question will be, governors and legislatures, are they willing to step up on behalf of kids? And as they react to the federal budget, uh, they need to tell their congressional representatives to fight for resources, but then they've got to react and say, what are we going to do as a state Whatever the feds are doing, what are we going to do to expand access to quality early learning? What are we going to do to make sure that kids in every high school in our state have access to advanced coursework? What are we going to do in our state to make sure that students have access to college? And these aren't partisan issues. You know, I think about a state like Tennessee, Governor Haslam, Republican. He's made strengthening the K-12 education system a top priority. He's made the Tennessee College Promise a priority so that in Tennessee you know you can get two years of college for, for free. Um, so this doesn't have to be about Democrats and Republicans. This is about our kids and making sure that we're investing in our, our long-term success as a country. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.